how's everyone today? Great. Welcome to present to Press. Andy Matos. Close enough. It's going to be our presenter today. I'd like to read her biography first. And I do have some handouts off here that I'll hand out once they introduce Andy. Andy began her journey as a trainer, facilitator, and public speaker when she joined Toastmasters in 2008. She is a member of the Chicago Toastmaster Clubs, Fox Valley Toastmasters, and sp sponsored a new Toastmaster, Toastmaster Charter Club, Care Masters, at the BD Vernon Hills office. She did that in 2012 and was recently selected, was awarded the Select Distinguished Recognition. Amy has served as Vice President of Public Relations, Vice President of Membership, and Club President. As Fox, Fox Valley Club President in 2011, Amy helped the club achieve a 10-point distinguished club program. She has competed at 10, excuse me, she has competed at club and area contests, and placed runner-up in 2009 and 2012 at Area 1. Amy has also presented the Toastmasters Leadership Institute and district conferences from 2008 to present. Amy served as Area 1 Governor, Northwest Division, 2011 through 2012, and lead Area 1 Chicago District 30 to achieve over 168% of the plan in leadership and membership growth. That's a big percentage, 168%. Amy has achieved her Distinguished Toastmaster Award, which is only achieved by 3% of the Toastmasters, in January 2013. She was recently selected to serve as an ambassador for Area 1 and 2, District 30, for the new Revitalized Education Program. You may know Amy as a sales training manager at BD Care Fusion for Infusion MMS and MPS sales. She also enjoys facilitating presentation skills, workshops for sales, clinical, marketing, and leadership teams. She has been recognized as a field sales trainer and a top sales performer at BD Care Fusion and has been in the sales and marketing profession for over 20 years. She's just celebrating her 10-year anniversary at BD Care Fusion in January, 20, January 23rd. Amy is the author of an Amazon 31 bestseller, <coughs> From Zero to Sales Hero, How to Double Your Sales and Income in 90 Days. Outside of work, she enjoys attending personal growth, self-development, and leadership workshops. Her hobbies include fitness, running, public speaking, traveling abroad with her husband Andy, and spending time with her four cats at her home outside of Chicago. Let's welcome Amy, present to impress. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and any dignitaries in the room, you should probably be at the business <laughs> But welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Before I get into my talk today, I have a question for all of you. How many of you have been at Toastmasters for one year or less? Raise your hands. Great. How about two years? Three years? Four years? Okay, five years? How about if you've been in Toastmasters for more than five years, keep your hand up and raise it high. Excellent. Wow, look at that. Thank you. Before I get started with our session today, I want to take a moment and acknowledge all of you. It's no secret there are other places you could be right now. You could be in the business meeting. You could be out getting coffee. You could be out doing your Saturday errands, but instead, you're taking investment in yourself and you're here to sharpen your skills. And for that, I want to say thank you. And I promise you, as a result of this session, whether you're someone that just started Toastmasters in the past year, or if you're an old person like 
me that's been in Toastmasters now for almost nine years, I think one thing that all of us can agree on, just like any sports team or any professional, how many of you agree we do need to go back to the basics once in a while? Exactly, great. So that's exactly what we are going to do today, is we are going to talk about the fundamentals. And what the fundamentals are, are four key areas. Number one, the impromptu speech, the elevator speech. We're also next going to focus on your presentation plan, how to engage the audience, and then we will focus on how you can present like a pro. Now since we're going to be spending some time together, I know Kathy told you a little bit about me during my bio, but would it be okay if I share a little bit about my story with all of you? Oh, sure. Can I jump in? Okay, great. I just want to make sure. I remember this time like it was just yesterday, and it was back in 2008. I had been in medical sales for a few years and I had just started working here in Chicago in a medical device company and I was selling medical systems that costed hospitals anywhere from a million up to six million dollars. And the sale could take anywhere from three months to three years to close. Now I was in my second year and my sales numbers were kind of like this and I was looking to go like this. How many of you are in sales can relate to that? Anybody? Okay, great. I see. Great, we got a lot of salespeople in the house. Awesome. My heart goes out to you. But when I was trying to go up here, one of the things I did is what we all do. Whether you're in a business or sales, we have to pick up the phone and call people and make contacts. So I was doing that one Friday afternoon. I was on the phone, prospecting, cold calling, however you want to call it. And I called a chief nurse officer of a particular health system here in the Chicago area. And I said, I would like to talk to you about how I can help improve safety, outcomes, and overall operating efficiency for your health system. And there was this dead pause. She said, I'd love to meet with you. I was so excited. I thought, wow, this could be my break. This could be the opportunity that if it came in, it'd be about $6 million against my $8 million quota, it would really help get me to the next level. So that was the first thought that went in my mind. But the second, more important thought was, I've got to get working on this presentation. So I got on the phone with my regional sales director, my area vice president, our health system executive, and a whole team of us began to get prepared for this talk we were going to give. Now my role that day was going to be very simple. I was going to give an introduction and I was going to talk for about 10 minutes about the state of the union with the health system, the discovery I had done, and I thought, hey, this might be a nice way to impress my boss in the room too. But then I remember the weeks leading up to that morning, the days leading up to that morning, the hours leading up to that presentation. And I remember that morning feeling a pit in my stomach. And I secretly wish I had never volunteered to give that introduction. And then the moment came. We were all sitting at a table almost like this. I was sitting in my chair, and it was my turn to stand up and give that introduction. And I remember I came up, and I stood in front of the room, and I remember feeling like I was in the black hole. I looked around, and to this day, I don't remember what I said. I do remember, I think I said three sentences. But I remember two more things. I was angry and I was humiliated myself. Because as I finished, I looked across the room and I saw my boss doing this. I knew I blew it. But, another thing happened. I became excited and I became motivated. I decided at that moment I have got to get better at public speaking if I'm going to continue selling to executive teams like this. Now at that moment, I remembered I was reading a book. It was called Selling to Vito, the very important top officer. Anybody in sales in this room that's not read that book, I highly recommend it. In the book it said if you are going to sell to leaders, executives, any product, you need to join Toastmasters. So at that moment, I thought, you know what, I'm willing to do anything. So I joined Toastmasters back in 2008. Now the good news is we did end up making that sale. We did recover from that moment I had, but 
what I learned, I think, from that whole experience is not only is being a better communicator, listener, and presenter a commitment, it's a decision. And it takes action on your part. But I learned something even bigger than that. It can be a lot of fun. How many of you are having fun here today? Everybody? Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is we are going to follow the handout that I've given all of you. If you don't have a handout, just raise your hand and Kathy can give you one. But I wanted to make this as easy to follow as possible. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about presenting in four key areas. So the first piece we're going to talk about is impromptu speaking, the icebreaker, you run into somebody in a hallway, or the elevator speech. The first tip I would like to give you, and you can follow along with me, is wait. The first thing you need to do is wait. When you ask somebody a question, wait seven seconds before you answer. How many times do you ask a question and you get uncomfortable with that silence? Remember, silence is golden. Give the other person an opportunity to answer your question. How many of you notice I've been asking a lot of questions today? <laughs> exactly. So it's a great way to engage the person you're talking to. Talk at a moderate pace. Talk at a moderate pace, even if you are nervous. I went to see a speaker a while back at one of our national sales meetings, and the person had an awesome message. It was very empowering and very uplifting, but he was talking like this, and I really honestly felt uncomfortable <laughs> listening to him because I could sense how nervous he was. Talk slower than you usually do. I am talking slower than I usually do in a normal conversation right now, but one of the first things that we need to overcome when we join Toastmasters is to focus on pacing and pausing our talk. And I'm not talking about just in front of a group like this. I'm talking about you walk up to somebody and you meet them for the first time, and you want to make a strong, favorable impression. Listen. When somebody is talking to you, instead of thinking about what you are going to say next, how many of us do that? I've been guilty of that before I admit it. Listen. And when I say listen, what I do sometimes when someone's talking to me, especially if it's somebody I've run into, like some executive or somebody, maybe I've run into to Jana in the hallway. Instead of thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm in front of Jana, it might be asking her a question and then she's answering that question. I'm thinking about, and I'm paraphrasing in my mind what she just said to me. So I might say, Jana, I just heard you make a couple points about A, B, C, and D. So if you paraphrase inside of your mind what they're saying and then you paraphrase it back to them, and the other thing that she said this morning that stuck out that I don't have on my handout that's important is to use the person's name. Use the person's name. When I was first in sales, I sold over the phone for a cellular phone company. And I, would, I, I couldn't see who I was talking to, so I would constantly, not constantly, but I would frequently use the person's name so that they knew that I was caring about them being on the other line, but it's also a great way to get somebody's attention to keep them engaged. Use the other person's name. Ignore and avoid. Ignore the little voice in your mind that is saying, don't do it, don't say it, you're going to screw up. I remember being on conference calls in my company, and I wanted to speak up. But I remember that little voice would say, oh my gosh, if you speak, you're going to sound really stupid, so don't do it. Does anybody ever deal with that sometimes? Okay, we all do. So the other thing that I refer to this is it's called mind frick. We all have mind frick. If you don't know what mind frick is, it's that voice that just right now said to you, what's mind frick? Why are you even in this room right now? But it's that little voice, the endless loop that keeps going. And when you hear that voice, just say thank you for sharing, do it anyway. Step outside your comfort zone. Another thing that has been demonstrated and proven is that the more, the more you speak, the more you raise your hands, the more you volunteer to do a session like this, the more you step up, the better you're going to get. Anyone that's been in Toastmasters for several years, do you agree with me that you do get better as you go along if you just practice? Yeah, exactly, done. exactly. And I have to say, I have not found a more safe and non-threatening environment than Toastmasters yes, to practice yes. public speaking in a safe and forum, right? Yeah. So that's the good news is that you have an opportunity to practice your skills in a safe, non-threatening environment versus the little mishaps I had at the beginning of my talk today when I was in front of an executive team. We've all given speeches that didn't go our way, or maybe we thought we could have done better, but the good news is you always have the opportunity to do it again in Toastmasters in practice. Be brief, be bright, be gone. 
Be brief, be bright, be gone. There was a certain nurse executive that I learned this saying from, but have you ever walked up to somebody and you're saying hello to them and you just want to make a conversation and all of a sudden they start telling a really long story? Yes. Yeah, yeah everybody, I see everybody laughing, I see heads nodding. But when that happens, it's difficult to listen to that person because you want to listen, you want to show them you care, but you're really starting to tune out. So it's important that, I always say, especially in sales calls, that each person should be talking 50% of the time. So avoid the long-winded stories and stay to the point, especially if you've only got two or three minutes in front of somebody. And don't repeat the same story you told them last time. Has anybody ever heard somebody that just kind of, they always, every time you see them, they say, hey, you want to be nice and respectful, but you're kind of like, okay, this last time I was in front of you. So anyway, be mindful of that as well. Okay, so now we're going to move into our presentation plan. So whether you're presenting to a group like this or a lot of what I'm about to share with you now is not only from Toastmasters and other facilitator workshops I've gone to, but a lot of it is from learnable moments. I didn't mention that yet. What, what did I do that didn't work? Okay, so the presentation plan. The first thing you need to focus on for your presentation plan is your context. Okay, so your context. Who can tell me what the theme of our meeting is this weekend? Sure. So are, exactly. That is an example of context. So the theme of the meeting is context. So that means I would not come up today and talk to you all about basket weaving, right? Because that does not match the context of what the conference is about. Think of the context as the cup. It's the overarching theme of whatever the event is that you're going to be speaking at. Start with a purpose process payoff, okay? And that's actually an old sales training something I learned years and years ago, but it's kind of like having an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So tell the audience what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them again. What we sometimes do is we do the next thing on your list is we start with our content, okay? So your content should come second. But have you ever gone to see somebody speak and you're not really sure where the talk starts, where it's going, and where it's gonna end up, and you're sitting there scratching your head? Okay, a lot of the times it happens because somebody is coming in and they're like, I just want to get this content to the audience, I want to get my message out, but they really haven't thought about the structure of it. So again, purpose, process, payoff, and focusing first on your context. Combine both business and personal interest. What do we mean by that? So if I stood up today and said, I'm going to tell you the top 10 tips of how to be a better speaker, and just went through a list, you all would be asleep in 10 minutes. But have you noticed I've been using a lot of stories? Okay, how many of you noticed how many stories Jana used this morning? I was very impressed because not only were the stories interesting, they were suspense suspenseful, and I don't know about all of you, but I learned a lot from just hearing her personal stories and what she had been through. Yes. So using personal stories as much as you can is also another great way to keep your audience engaged and to keep your speech interesting. Prepare in advance. Expect the best and prepare for the worst. Again, prepare in advance. Expect the best and prepare for the worst. This includes audiovisual and other presenters. I remember one time in my medical sales career, I was getting ready to present at a certain hospital, and I thought I had arrived early enough. I don't think I had, though, because the projector was sitting right here, and the man from the AV department was working on the projector for about the first 25 minutes of my talk. And luckily, luckily, thank you, Lord, I had my talk pretty much memorized, so I didn't have to rely on the PowerPoint slides, but had I not had that talk memorized, let's all agree, it probably would have been a disaster. I also had one time where I was going to co-present a certain presentation with somebody. We were going to do a whiteboard. I was going to do one piece, and the person was going to do the other piece. And she called me on the way to class that day saying, oh, you know what? I got up. I'm sick. I can't be there. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I've never done her presentation before, but luckily I happened to have some notes of the presentation she was going to do, so I was able to do it. So you never know what can happen. Just expect the unexpected. Has anybody ever had anything unexpected happen when they're going to? Yeah, okay. Yep, we've all been there before. Kiss. Keep it short and simple. Keep it short and simple. K-I-S-S. -S. I'm not saying the other kiss that we all know about. I'm not calling anybody stupid today. But it's keep it short and simple. 
So there's a couple thoughts on this. Number one, if you have to use PowerPoint, put one single idea on a slide. Again, I'm, I'm giving Jan a lot of compliments today, but I noticed her slides. How many of you noticed that she had like a picture and like a single phrase? Wasn't that nice? Yeah. But how many times do we sit there and we are working on a slide deck and I'm, you know, we're sitting there and we're trying to make the font as small as possible so we could just squeeze something else in there or making the text box a different size hoping it's all going to fit. Don't do that. I've been guilty of it myself, but one of the ideas I like, Steve Jobs actually wrote, the late Steve Jobs wrote a really great presentation skills book and one of the things he says is to put a single picture on a slide. Yes. So a single picture. So when he introduced the iPhone, he said, what would it be like to have your phone, your music, the internet, how would it be to have all of that on one device? And that was kind of like he lifted the veil and you saw a picture of the iPhone. So making it a single picture is not only impactful to the audience, it keeps us also out of the habit of, have you ever seen somebody present and they're reading their slides like this, or they're looking up at the screen the whole time? If we do too much of that, it breaks our connection with the audience. So just use your slides as maybe a guideline or make a single point with it. Body talk. Okay, I find this so interesting. Do you know that 55% of what we see, what we are communicating is our body language, 38% is voice tonality, and 7% is words. Wow. Wow, to me that's amazing. But what that means is that our gestures need to be meaningful. I remember when I first joined Toastmasters, I'm a little bit expressive, but I remember I would do this all the time with my hands, and I've seen people do that before, or sometimes you see people pace back and forth. But instead of just making gestures, just make gestures, make them meaningful. If you are someone like me who has a challenge sometimes with not keeping their hands down, another thing you can also do is this is called the steeple. Everybody try this. This is the steeple. So it doesn't mean you're praying. You can against praying, but the steeple, you can do this or you can bring it down lower. But if you don't know what to do with your hands, this instills, this actually is a symbol of self confidence. And it's nice instead of sticking your hands in your pocket or jingling your change and doing too much arm movement, sometimes you can just bring it together like the cathedral. Does that make sense? That, does that feel good when you do that? Yes. It does? Okay, great. Just wanted to check. So the next piece is questions. Questions is the last part on your handout at the bottom. Questions, anyone. Questions are important for your session, but they need to be managed correctly. So what I do when I do presentations, especially a group that's this size, is I hold my question and answer until the end. And I promise, by the way, I will give you all an opportunity to ask questions. But what can happen is if you take questions throughout your presentation, even though they're usually great questions, I've seen it happen before where one person asks a question and then they, we answer it. And then somebody else says, well, what about this? And before we know it, we've got this like cross debate or cross talk going. And then somebody else jumps in. And then, number one, you've lost control of your presentation, but you've also given up some very valuable presentation time. And how many of us know that in Toastmasters, we do watch our time, right? Yeah. Even today, I'm on a very tight time limit. Kathy's up here with my timer cards, making sure that I don't go into your lunch break. Okay, so now I'm on the second page. So allow at least 10 minutes for Q&A at the end if you can squeeze that into your presentation versus doing it throughout the presentation. For difficult audience members, has anybody ever presented and you had somebody in the audience, so no matter what you're saying, they're either looking down or they're saying things that are maybe derogatory or I have, okay. Anybody that's been in sales or business, unfortunately, I think it's happened to all of us. One of the things that I've learned at some of the facilitator workshops I've been to is if you do have a very difficult audience member, stay in control. Okay, stay in control. And that means acknowledge the person. What's your name, by the way? Rudy. Rudy. So it might be Rudy. I really appreciate the point you're making. It's very valuable, and I'm glad you're sharing it with us. Is there any way that you can meet with me after this talk today so that we could talk more about it and that I could get more input on what you're saying? Say yes. <laughs> so, yes, okay. So you'll notice that I did treat him with respect and I acknowledged him even though, let's just say he was being a little bit rude, no, no, no pun intended, Rudy, but if he was being rude and saying things or being derogatory, be respectful. But the one thing you don't want to do is I don't want to get into it back and forth with him. I've seen that happen. One time one of my old sales managers did that with somebody in the audience. Not only was it weird and awkward, 
all the attention went to them and it took time away from our presentation, which again is something you don't want. Present like a pro. We're going to talk about a few tips to present like a pro. So the first one is timing is everything. Timing is everything. If I know I'm going to go over my time limit in a professional setting or any type of setting except for Toastmasters because we got the timing cards, I might say, oh, Rudy, I'm gonna, I, I, can I have five more minutes? I think that we're getting close to the end of our time. Would that be okay with you? If he's in charge of the room, I'm going to ask him that. But if I don't ask him that, you notice people start kind of fidgeting and it's kind of weird and awkward and I'm so into what I'm talking about, I stop paying attention. People get up and start leaving. You might be making your most important points at the end of your talk, so don't lose the time. Just ask who's ever in charge if you can have those extra five minutes. Practice makes prepared. Practice makes prepared. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to practice. Practice in front of a mirror, your friends, a webcam, if you really want to get daring. I know it's uncomfortable to watch ourselves on video. I'm going to watch the video of Paul's taking of me later. But this is the only way we're going to get better. And the more practice you do, the more rehearsals you do for your talk, research and evidence has also shown that it, the less likely it will be that you will get nervous when you come up to talk. Does everybody remember when Press Vastulev won the yes. international? Yes. Okay, so those of you who don't know me, he's from Chicago, originally from Bolivia. He went to the international stage and competed a few years ago. He won the world championship in public speaking. Wow. I asked him how many times he practiced his speech at a club in this area. Do you know what he told me? Does anybody want to guess? Hundreds. Hundreds. I'll get specific. 500 times. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. So I'm not telling all of you you've got to practice your talk 500 times, but if you want to get to the international stage, you do. But that's what we mean by rehearsal, how important it is. Speak up. Project your voice. You might notice I project my voice, but if you have a quiet voice, get a microphone. Sometimes I present sessions right at 1 o'clock after lunchtime. And what happens after lunchtime? Food coma. I love it. So people get in a food coma, so I will use my voice intentionally during those sessions to try to keep people awake. When we talk about feedback, your feedback should be motivating, encouraging, and constructive. So whether you are the speaker or after, if anybody is trying to get better as a speaker, always ask for feedback. But when you do give somebody else feedback, make sure it's motivating, encouraging, and constructive. Which means you're telling them what they did well, and then you're telling them at least one or two things to improve upon to be even more effective. Engage the audience. You must engage the audience from the start, okay? You must engage the audience from the start. How do I engage the audience? I ask questions, I raise my hands, I get the audience engaged. But the audience decides within seconds of your presentation if they're going to listen to you or not. So your introduction and the way you set yourself up is actually selling the audience on why they should or should not listen to you. Very critical. Ask open-ended questions instead of yes or no. Ask open-ended questions instead of yes or no questions, except for if it's a hand raise, sometimes that's fun. The other thing that I wanted to mention is with the raising the hands and audience participation. Another idea is to invite people to share. If you have time, maybe, has that ever happened to you? And let them share their experience, and that, that gets people engaged. You get some kind of welcomed into your session. Save it for later. Save it for later. If you have handouts, save it for the end, except the handout I'm giving you today, I'm calling an active handout because you're filling in the blanks. But if you have any literature or a product you're trying to sell or some points you're trying to make, I usually try to save those for the end because if not, what do people do with handouts if you give them out early? They, they, they flip, they, you hear the people pumping, they're looking down, and then they're distracted. Avoid hiding behind the podium for your entire presentation. Avoid hiding behind the podium. Now, I was presenting last week to a sales team, and I had to use a really huge manual, so I didn't have to come to the podium, but I would look at my notes and I would come back out. The main thing you don't want to do is grip on for dear life, okay? Because that's kind of, unless you're a preacher at church, it's kind of awkward, and it, it, it shows you may be a little bit nervous. You might be sending the wrong message to your audience. 
We already talked about using less PowerPoint. How many of you noticed I'm not using PowerPoint today? Right. Not saying it's bad, but if you do use it, minimize it. Eliminate filler words. Eliminate filler words like um and ah. Uh. Okay, I think we know that. We or thank, thank God we have the grammarian that always keeps us mindful of that. But I always share this example. Do you know how many times, I'm not saying I like President Obama, I'm not saying I don't like President Obama, but does anybody want to guess how many ums and uhs he said in his inaugural address? Too many. I heard too many. <laughs> 100. Oh, I didn't 100. Hear so don't um and ah. The power of the pause. The power of the pause. Pausing is a great way to collect your thoughts, to help your audience think about what you just said, and it can really add a lot of impact to what you've just said as well. Do more. Improvise if you get stuck or if you forgot what you're going to say. Improvise if you get stuck or if you forgot what you were going to say. One of my favorite sayings in Toastmasters is there was the speech you were going to give, the speech you gave, and the speech you wish you had given. How many of you agree with me on that? Then yes, you have to improvise. If I sat today and just read a speech word for word and then I forgot it, I wouldn't have anything to talk about. So what I try to do is I try to just think about what my key points are. When I was really doing Toastmasters, three by five note cards are a great way to practice your speech. Just put the keywords on there. Stay away from writing out your whole speech unless you are giving a keynote address or something that you're going to be talking for maybe an hour. Improvise. I said that voice command will help you own the room. Voice command will help you own the room. Have you ever gone to see a speaker that you can't hear them speak? Oh, yeah. What happens to the audience? They go to sleep. So, so use your voice command. Have a conversation with the audience. Have a conversation with the audience. What this means is you don't want to talk in a monotone, or you don't want to talk really so high that you can't keep up with it, but just talk like you're having a conversation. Smile. Be yourself. Sometimes you see, and this is another reason to watch yourself on video, is that you can see your facial expressions. And one of the first things I noticed when I first watched myself on a video, as painful as that was, is I wasn't smiling. I was really serious, and I was, you know, try, and I, and I, ever since I'm like, okay, I gotta smile. Because I, I usually, I do like to smile. But the more you smile, and the more you just be yourself, the easier of an experience it's going to be. Nobody knows you better than you, so be yourself and just show up as you are. I saved the best for last. <laughs> Screw up, shut up. <laughs> Screw up, shut up. Have you ever gone to see somebody speak and they're in the middle of the speech and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't remember what I was going to say, I totally forgot, right? Okay, so the audience does not know you made a mistake and they really don't care until you say something about it. So with that, keep going, don't bring it up. I remember one time I was facilitating a sales training and there was somebody that came to present on a certain product and she stood up and she said in front of a group just like this, I've never presented this before. I feel really nervous right now. And I was like, you can feel the energy go in the room. I mean, I just wanted to go up and hug her and say, it's going to be okay. But it, was really, it was just really kind of a weird moment. So don't tell people, yeah, you can tell them afterwards, hey, I just did that for the first time. Wasn't that great? That sounds a little bit better after you've given the talk. So don't say that to the audience. Okay. Now, I wanted to make sure that I kept some extra time for questions and answers. So I am now going to open it up for Q&A from anyone. Yes? Could you please give the name of the book, that first book you said uh, by D. Jones? So, oh, Selling to Vito? Yes. Okay, so Selling to Vito. B selling to Vito? B-I-T-O, and it's by Tony Piranello. Okay. B is in Victor? Yeah, B is in Victor. So it stands for the very important top officer, Vito. Selling to Vito. What's the last name of the author? The author is Tony Piranello, P-A-R-I-N-E-L-L-O. Question up here? Yes, hi. Um, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I'm trying to learn how to talk without notes. Okay. So I'm, you know, and I'm new, and I'm amazed at how you Toastmasters get up there and don't use any notes. So any hints on that? Are you memorizing? Are you looking at notes once in a while? Right. That's a great question. So it's, 
it's okay to use notes when you're first getting into Toastmasters when you're getting started. In my in my opinion, I did use notes and note cards, but what I would try to do over time with each speech, I would I would try to use less use less and less notes. So again, the three to five three by five note cards I would use, and I would just put my introduction, body conclusion, and I would just write a couple key phrases because if you can get to a point where you're putting less and less and less on those note cards, then the less you're going to use the notes. And again, practice. Could I say something on note cards? Yes, Paul. Being a more technical person, if you're giving a technical presentation that has a lot of data that you must get correct, or if you're using quotes, you don't want to misquote somebody famous. Those are more than acceptable to put on cards. And if somebody says something about using a card when you're doing that, you tell them they're wrong. Because if it's data or a quote, that you must get correct, you must have it written down. Mm -hmm. Good point. But I just, I would just say practice, 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 and minimize it. And I agree with what Paul said too. It just takes time. Yes? Question? Yep. Um, I was wondering, I was wondering how you are able to make distinctions when you're talking to people in different, um, Categories like whether it's children, adults, uh, at a school or at a church. How do you separate all of those things, even though they're kind of interconnected? Okay, so like, how do I approach them, or how do I speak differently to them? Yes. Okay. So that's that's a great question that you're asking. The way that I I and it's funny I'm going back to Jane again, but I really try to treat everybody equally. I try to be myself, and I try to treat whether they're children or whether they are adults or if they're high-end executives. I show up as who I am and I think with that is just focusing on my self-confidence. Um, one thing that I say to myself consistently, I did it before the session that you might maybe just something to try on, is it's about them. It's about all of you, it's not about me because when we get nervous and we get fidgety and we um and ah uh and you know, we feel the sweat running down our back, it's because we're thinking about ourselves. Yeah. Right? It's because we're thinking about, oh, what if they don't like me, or what if, you know, what if uh, they don't like my talk, what am I going to do? Instead, what I try to tell myself is it's about the audience, it's about the audience. And I'm doing that more and more every time I speak, as I try to remember it's about all of you, and my goal is I want to make sure all of you get at least three points that you can use to be even better presenters than you already are. So maybe that's something I would suggest, too. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yes, question? What was the word in the first line under engage the audience? Yeah. Oh, okay, under engage the audience, you must engage the audience from the start. Must engage the audience from the start. Question? Uh, why is it that you prefer flip charts to parts? That's a great question, too. The, one of the, the recent breakthroughs in sales and selling methodologies in businesses is the, white, the whiteboard is a big thing. I think it was FedEx, one of the big freight companies, shipping companies, showed one recently. But the thing that is great about whiteboards, and there is a book about whiteboards. I'll, I'll give you the title because I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. But whiteboards are a dialogue. So when you flip chart things, you are having a dialogue with somebody, and when you get into PowerPoint, the, the thing about PowerPoint is that so many of us have a tendency to abuse PowerPoint by either putting too much information or making the PowerPoint deck too long. And people, when, if I had PowerPoint right there, the more that I've got PowerPoint up, you're looking at that screen and you're, we're not connecting with each other. So that's the reason I tried. I do have to do PowerPoint for some product presentations I do. So I'm not going to say I never do it. It's horrible. But I try to when I can not use it like a session for today. Does that, make, does that help you a little bit? Okay. Question? Yes. Uh, what was the third bullet point under presentation plan? Okay. Under presentation plan, content. Content. Question. Yeah, you had said, oh, I'll come to you in a second. Okay, what do you do to practice to get rid of filler words? Filler words? One of the things that I, I think the best way that I have been able to get through my ums and uhs, you knows and likes, is really to be, I mean, I'm selling Toastmasters, but to go to Toastmasters and practice speaking and hear how many times you do it. Because I did a workshop a, a while back outside of Toastmasters, and we did a Someone counted the ums and uhs, and there was somebody that did 40. And then I saw them present a few months later, and the person had it down to like five. 
So the first step of change is awareness. So the more you know you're doing it, the more you know what those numbers are, the more you know you can improve it. That's, that's Toastmaster, I, I probably have to tip my hat to Toastmasters as far as how I got rid of them. It's just hearing and being aware. Slowing down and pausing and breathing would be the other advice I'd give for that. And yes, young lady that had your hand raised. Oh, I like the young <laughs> Thank you. Con yes. Under number two, presentation plan, it says who is your, if I can say, audience. Who is your audience? That's right. Okay. Who is your audience? And then after that is context. Yes. Content. content uh huh, that's correct. Prepare, kiss, body language. Correct. You got okay. it. You got it. Yeah. Yes, I in the back. Thank you. Hi. I had a question. I was giving a training workshop yesterday, trying to be engaging, and so I invited input and folks to share their stories. But what happened was they shared, somebody else reacted, somebody else reacted. So there was all this crosstalk, and I didn't know how to regain okay. control. How do you how do you do that and get back on track? Okay. It's, it has happened to me before, and the way that I try to keep it on track is I, when, it, when someone shares, I just, I, maybe I'll set a ground rule in a group facilitation training that, you know, one person talks and raises their hand at a time, and then if it does get into that crosstalk situation, even if it's not good talk that's going on, I might just say, you know, this is a really great discussion that's going on. Thank you all so much for sharing. I want to make sure that we don't miss anything on the agenda today, so let's move forward, and then afterwards we'll make sure we have some more time to share these stories. But take control of the situation and you use your voice, set the guideline in the beginning, one person talks at a time, and, and get out of the rabbit hole. That's, that's the way that I would approach that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? My question is, can this template be used with your permission to facilitate a speaking engagement to young students at a grammar school? Yes, if you see me after the session, Give me your email address, I can send it to you. Thank you. And before I wrap up, I did want to share with all of you that someone um, is going to get a prize. I do have a few copies of my book here. And is there anybody today that has a birthday? Oh, it's your birthday. All right, Kevin, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Happy, happy birthday, by the way. And anyone else that's interested, I do have a few copies of my book. It's, the again, From Zero to Sales Hero, How to Double Your Sales and Income in 90 Days. I do have a section on presentation skills in the book because I believe if you are going to be selling or if you're in a business, no matter what we are doing in the professional world, it is critical that we can present. So I do have a section in there on that, and I have them on sale today for $10. So does anyone have any final questions or comments? before we wrap up. Paul? The video for this presentation and all the video taken at this conference should be available a week from tomorrow at timsvideo.com. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Cool. And let's give a round of applause to Paul and also to Kathy for Thank you. 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 Thank you.